Well, as we come to our time for the teaching of God's Word again, I want to invite you to turn with me in the Gospel of Mark, where we have been uh, going through a study of this Gospel for several months now. We're going to be looking today at Mark chapter 7, the end of chapter 7. I'll be reading from verse 31 down through the end of the chapter. So I invite you to follow along with me in your copy of God's Word as I read from the Scriptures. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre, and he went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, Jesus put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed, and he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray together. Father God in heaven, we need you to do for us what Jesus did for this man, that you would unstop our ears, that we might hear clearly the teaching of your truth, the claims of the gospel, that we might see, Lord, with eyes of faith, the glory, your glory reflected in the face of your son, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come and Shine the light of your word into the depths of our hearts and as a lamp to our feet as we seek to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. But Lord God, we give this time to you and ask that you would speak to us, that you would sanctify us through your truth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we have been going through Mark's gospel these past five months, we've been with Jesus in all kinds of situations and had a chance to see and hear him in action as he's been ministering throughout the region of Galilee and now moving up into the surrounding Gentile territories. We've seen the, the kinds of people that he chooses to relate to and spend time with. We've seen how he responds to pressure and criticism his reaction to hostile opponents and life-threatening situations. We've seen how he handles fame and how he deals with frustration. We've heard his teaching on the kingdom of God and watched him interact with and embrace people from, from all over the political and social, economic, and, and now even the ethnic spectrum. We've watched Jesus perform amazing miracles of all kinds. And as he's, as he's done all of this, we've heard him repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, tell people, not to say anything, not to spread the word of his miraculous works to others, which we hear him do again here at the end of Mark chapter 7. But to no avail, because the people are once again astonished and amazed, and they say of Jesus, he has done all things well. And indeed, that's true. In fact, as you consider Jesus and his ministry, as Mark records it for us, I think you'd find very few people who would disagree with that statement. Jesus has done all things well. And I don't think you can honestly look at anything that, that Jesus says or does in the gospel and say, well, you know what, I don't, I don't think he handled that really well. I mean, here's a man who's healing outcast lepers, who's straightening crooked limbs of, of lame people. He's reforming uh, corrupt tax collectors. He's confronting hypocritical leaders. He's rescuing imperiled fishermen and liberating demon-possessed souls. He's teaching life-transforming truth and feeding hungry crowds, bridging racial divides, even bringing little children back from the jaws of death. I mean, even those who are, are critical or hostile towards Christianity usually don't focus their criticism on the person and the ministry of Jesus. I mean, how can you argue with what Jesus does? He does all things well. Usually the place where people struggle and the place where they stumble with Jesus is in dealing with the implications of what he does in terms of his identity and his mission. 
Jesus doing all things well, it was not meant to, to gain him a good reputation or establish him as a great religious leader. But his teaching and his miracles are meant to reveal the identity and the reality of who he is and why he has come. Jesus does all things well, not because he's a good person, but because he's the son of God who has come as a man to redeem man from sin and to restore God's kingdom. And we see this particularly here in this passage in Mark chapter 7, where Jesus heals this man who is deaf and has a, has a speech impediment. And before we jump into the passage, I just want to note that, that Mark makes a connection here with an Old Testament passage that we actually read last week. And I want to invite you to turn there. It's found in Isaiah chapter 35. There in Isaiah 35, God is speaking of, of the day when he will come and ransom his people and restore his creation and usher in his kingdom. His glory will be seen and he will, he will come and save his people. And he speaks of how we will know that day has come. And he says in Isaiah 35, verse 5, he says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the moot will, swing, will sing for joy. Now the word used in Mark, back in Mark chapter 7 to refer to this man's speech impediment and Jesus making the, the mute speak is the Greek word mogilalos. I love that word, mogilalos. It's the only time it's used in the New Testament, and the only other time it appears anywhere in the scriptures is in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And it's used to translate the Hebrew term here in Isaiah 35, 6, the term tongue of the mute. It's that same word, mogilaos. Now, the majority of commentators agree that, that Mark is making a distinct connection here to God's promise in Isaiah, that the miracles of Jesus, like this one with this man, are not just acts of compassion, but they are indicators that God's salvation has come, that his glory has been revealed, that the new day of redemption and restoration, pictured back in Isaiah 35, has arrived in the person of Jesus. And Jesus' miracles are not just indicators of his goodness, but of his godness. And we see that vividly portrayed in this, this incident in which Jesus heals this man with deaf ears and a mute tongue. Mark is the only gospel that records this account, which takes place in the region of the Decapolis, um, where Jesus ends up after what is probably six to eight months of, of ministry in predominantly Gentile territory, after a, a circuitous journey from the cities of Tyre and Sidon on the coast of the Mediterranean, uh, down to the Sea of Galilee, to the region of of the Decapolis. You might remember the Decapolis is, is where we saw Jesus heal the demon-possessed man among the tombs back in Mark chapter 5. And you may remember back then that the people begged Jesus to leave them alone. But now we find a, a group bringing this deaf, mute man to Jesus and begging him to heal him. And what I want to look at today is how Jesus approaches and deals with this man and how his approach reveals to us God's amazing grace in approaching and dealing with sinners like you and me. And I want us to see vividly portrayed um, in, this, uh, in his approach to this man how Jesus deals with us personally, prayerfully, and powerly. So let's look first at how Jesus approaches this man and us personally. We're told that uh, a group of people brought this man to Jesus who was deaf, and as is often the case with those who, who cannot hear uh, to form words and syllables correctly, he cannot speak very clearly. He had a speech impediment. And after all that, Jesus, after all that Jesus has done in terms of, of the miracles, this miracle doesn't seem like very unusual, even particularly, particularly difficult request. We half expect Jesus to just speak a word as he has in so many other instances and, and get this one done quickly. But Jesus handles this, uh, this man who's 
whole world has been silenced and cut off by his condition in a different way, in a very personal way. He begins by taking him aside, away from the crowd, privately, and, and speaking to him. Perhaps they, they went into a home or he drew him away to a, a secluded area where the crowds couldn't press in with their eagerness to see his miracles. But Jesus disappoints the crowd. He, he wasn't there to make a spectacle of this man. He's not interested in, in promoting himself as a great miracle worker. He doesn't want to have this, this captured on video and going viral on social media. He's not, he's not there to hype his ministry, but he's there to heal this deaf man. Remember, this man cannot hear a thing. He's probably a little unsure of all this going on. Perhaps he's a little anxious at what all this, this hubbub is about. The crowds are pushing in to see a miracle, but Jesus' only interest is this man and his need. And in order to allay his fears, in order to address his concerns personally, Jesus, Jesus takes him off, pulls him off in private, treating him with dignity and respect and a tenderness. And you know, that's, that's really how gracious Jesus is in dealing with us. You know, you're not a performer in God's dog and pony show. You're not a, a pawn in some game for Jesus to make his name great. His name already is great. You are a, a precious person that he knows intimately, that he cares about sincerely, that he loves deeply. Jesus will at times pull us away from the crowd, from the clamor and craziness all around us to address our need personally because he personally knows exactly what we need. Like a loving parent who, who takes a child who's been hurt or, or needs correction or has done something embarrassing, you know, you don't deal with that out among the crowds. You pull your child aside personally and privately in a, in a loving, gracious manner. And, and that's what Jesus is doing here. He knew that this man, he knew what this man needed. And so he takes him aside and then notice what he does next. It says he takes him aside and he, and he touches him right where he needs to be touched. Remember again, Jesus could have, he could have just spoken a word and healed this man like that. And indeed, we'll see he eventually does that. But he begins by speaking a different language, speaking a language that this man can understand, a kind of, a kind of sign language, if you will, showing him what he plans to do. And again, he, he enters into this man's world. He gets up very close and personal. Jesus, Jesus is very hands-on, you might say, in his ministry. And he, he puts his fingers in the man's ears as if to say, I know you're deaf and I'm gonna unstop your ears. And then he, he spits on his fingers and, and he takes this, the saliva and he puts it on the man's tongue as if to say, I know your tongue is tied and I'm gonna loosen it. You see, friends, Jesus is not an isolated, detached, distant Savior. He's one who, who comes close. He's not afraid to, to get into our personal space. He does not hesitate to, to reach out and to, to touch us at the very point of our deepest need, that we might know his tender compassion, that we might receive his healing grace. And he comes right down and he enters into the, the midst of our trouble so that we might know he truly understands. Jesus truly cares. He deals with this man personally, taking him aside, touching his, his deaf ears and, and loosening and touching his tongue and meeting him right where he needed to be met. And after touching him, we're told that he does something else. He, he looks up to heaven and he sighs. Jesus not only approaches this man personally, but he ministers to him prayerfully. Now, why would Jesus do this? Because as, as we just alluded to, Jesus comes to enter fully into our humanity. Though he was by very nature God, he, he humbled himself in the form of a servant. He takes on the, the full nature of, of humanity, but yet without sin. And so if this man was to be healed, if this man was to, to be healed, it was not because Jesus performed some magical uh, spell by touching his ears and his tongue. 
It would be because he looked to God the Father to work his healing grace through Jesus. We've seen Jesus make prayer a priority before, not because it's something good to do, not because he wants to model it for us, but because like you and me, apart from God the Father, Jesus can do nothing. Jesus was dependent on the Father, and so he looks up to God the Father prayerfully, interceding on behalf of this man. And here is Jesus the Son, our Savior, not relying on himself, but looking to the Father to do his work and to do his will through his Son. And as Jesus prays, it wasn't a little perfunctory prayer either. He didn't just say, okay, before I do this, let me throw up a quick one to the man upstairs. Lord, thanks for this opportunity. Bless this man. Help me to help him. Now, Mark tells us Jesus sighed. He, this is a word of passion. This is a, a heavy sigh, a deep groaning, a burden, a heartfelt pity and sadness over the condition of this man. It's a, it's a grumbling against the the damaging effects of sin that drives one to cry out to God. It's the same word used in Romans 8.23 and 2 Corinthians 5.2 that speak of the, the inward groaning or the longing that we have for heaven. Oh Lord, why is it like this? When will it be over? This was not just another case for Jesus to cure. Jesus looked at this man, saw his condition, saw that this was not how he had created him and how life was supposed to be, and he is moved, he is burdened. Jesus himself is touched deeply by his need, and so he looks to heaven on his behalf. You know, I remember years ago when I was a, a young Christian, we had a, a missionary from Romania come and talk to our Sunday school class. And as he talked about the people of Romania and the oppression they'd suffered under communism and the thousands who didn't know Christ and, and the thousands of orphans who were abandoned and, and living in squalor, he started to choke up and tears were in his eyes. And as he prayed, he started uh, crying out loud. And, and you know what I thought at that moment? As I was praying there, I, I literally thought, and I confess this, this guy's a little emotional. This guy's, uh, I actually thought that. You know why? Because I'd never been burdened by like that over someone. I'd never been burdened by the brokenness and the pain that sin, sin brings. But thankfully, God over time has, has softened my heart. And now I, I often look to heaven and I sigh, seeking God's mercy and his healing grace. Friends, Jesus knows our need personally. He bears that burden before God the Father in prayer and ultimately in his own body on the cross. Are you sad? Well, Jesus knows what it is to be sad. He was a, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Are you lonely? Jesus was rejected by family. He was betrayed by friends. He was forsaken by his heavenly Father. Do you suffer at the hands of, of another? Jesus was reviled, mocked, falsely accused, beaten and unjustly murdered at the hands of others. Are you tempted in some way? Well, Jesus was tempted beyond what we can imagine, and yet he didn't sin. You see, Jesus has touched life at all its sticking points. He knows your need, and he knows your pain better than you do. There is no burden that you bear that Jesus himself has not borne for you to a far greater degree that he carries, uh, the burden that he carries to the Father in heaven and ultimately bearing it upon himself on the cross. You see, Jesus approaches this man personally and he ministers to him prayerfully. And lastly, he heals this man powerfully. Jesus calls this man aside privately and he touches him tenderly. He prays for him and then he speaks to him powerfully and he says to him, Ephatha, which in Aramaic means be opened. And, and Mark tells us his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Talk about power. Again, Jesus speaks a word and this man can, can all of a sudden hear a pin drop. He can speak in, in clear, eloquent sentences. He can understand what is being said to him. He can share his, his thoughts with others. The deaf will hear and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. 
And the first thing Jesus says after he, he gives this man ears to hear and a tongue to sing is he says, don't tell anyone about this. I mean, really? Can you, can you imagine? Why would Jesus say that? Well, remember, Jesus is not here as a miracle worker, but he's here as a redeemer, as savior. And he knows that his greatest miracle is still to come. And it's the one that, that people will not receive with much enthusiasm and awe as the healing of this deaf man. The most powerful work yet to be done by Jesus will also be the most painful work undertaken by Jesus. To suffer for man's sin, to bear in himself the full effect and punishment for all, of, all man's sin, to be forsaken by his heavenly Father on the cross. You see, Jesus knows that many who rush to him for the healing uh, of their bodies will forsake him when he suffers and dies on the cross. He knows that, that what people need is not signs, but salvation. And he knows that the only sign that can ultimately bring that salvation is the sign of the cross, where he will be lifted up to the place of sinners. You see, just as the miracles point to who Jesus is as the Son of God, God's coming Redeemer, they also show us our great need as sinners for a Savior. Sin makes us spiritually unclean and rejected like the leper. It makes us spiritually disfigured like the lame. It makes us spiritually despised like the tax collector. It makes us spiritually bound like the demon-possessed. It makes us spiritually dead like the, the little girl. And this man, and like this man, it makes us spiritually deaf to God's truth and unable to speak his praises. As God said of his rebellious people, we have ears, but we don't hear. We have eyes, but we can't see. Our rebellious hearts don't understand and our, our tongues are, are instruments of evil apart from God's powerful healing grace. And Jesus comes and on the cross, he becomes unclean. He is rejected. He is disfigured. He is despised and bound and suffers death, the death that we deserve. And then rising from the grave, he breathes new life into our dead souls and he, he takes our deaf ears and he opens them to the good news of the gospel. And he takes our stammering tongues and he loosens them to sing his praise and to proclaim his glory. And he does it by the power of his spirit through the word of the gospel interceding for us before the Father that we might be made whole. You see, Jesus knows that the ultimate sign and healing power of the cross is yet to come. And so he, he charges this man who now can finally speak and others with him to be silent. But it's the one thing that this man cannot do. And the more Jesus told them to, to tone it down, the more zealously they proclaimed his healing power. Why is it that this man whom Jesus commands to tell no one cannot be quiet, while we whom, whom Jesus commands to go and to, to preach the gospel to all the nations proclaim the good news, are sometimes reticent to even say a word. Perhaps it's that your ears have never truly heard and your heart has never truly embraced the good news of the gospel. That Jesus, the Son of God, died for your sin and rose again to give you forgiveness and freedom, righteousness and eternal life. Maybe right now Jesus is, is speaking to you through the, this message and through his word, saying to your ears, be opened saying to your soul, you're forgiven, you are free. If so, then friend, I encourage you to, to hear his voice, to call out for salvation, to receive his grace and, and shout for joy that he has done all things well. Jesus is speaking through his words to those who have ears to hear. And if you don't know him, if you're still unsure about him, I challenge you to, to take up the Word of God, to read through the, the Gospels, maybe the Gospel of Mark as we've been going through it, and ask God to, to give you ears to hear and a heart to believe. Because if you seek Him with a humble heart and a sincere desire to know Him, He will open your ears. and He will give you eyes to see His glory and His grace in Jesus Christ. 
Perhaps you might remember the day that Jesus first reached out and touched your soul. When you heard and embraced the gospel and didn't what couldn't wait to go out and tell others about it. But but maybe over the years, maybe your your hearing of the word has become dulled. Maybe your your heart has uh, has grown a bit hard. Maybe the word has been drowned out by the noises of, of the other worldly voices clamoring for attention. Maybe your tongue has grown tired and tied such that you find it harder to pray passionately, harder to, to, to proclaim the good news, harder to, to praise the Lord joyfully. Well, maybe you need to, to draw aside privately with Jesus. Get away from the crowds. Get away from the clamor. Bring to him your burden. Tell him of your sin, your fear, your struggle. Spend time personally listening to him in his word and soaking in his promises. Let his truth touch you at, at your point of need and receive his, his powerful healing grace. And let me say a word to the young people who may be listening. Let me encourage you. Jesus knows right where you are. He knows your needs. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows the, the doubts you may be wrestling with. There are voices shouting, shouting and clamoring for your attention, your allegiance, telling you what you should think, how you should respond, what you should say in these difficult days. And Jesus will not try to outshout them, but he will draw you aside in his word. He will speak truth personally to your soul. He will give you wisdom, compassion, grace, guidance and forgiveness, hope and peace that the world can never provide. And your parents cannot hear for you. And so I encourage you, open the book. Hear the voice of God speaking to you personally. Jesus does all things well through the personal, prayerful, powerful ministry of his saving, healing grace. And so Lord, give us ears to hear and to listen and to trust in you, our Savior, and give us tongues to praise and proclaim you as King. Let's pray together. Father God, that is our prayer, that we would be those who not only hear, but we listen and we believe and we follow you with all our heart. And Lord, that we would be people who boldly speak of all that you have done, who sing your praises, who proclaim the gospel to all who will listen. And Father, I pray right now that for those who are experiencing difficulty, going through trials, wrestling with various needs, Father, as we hear the clamor of the world around us, many voices calling out to us, Lord, I pray that you would draw us aside that you would come to us personally, that you would touch each person right where they needed, need to be touched in a manner that, that they might know and receive your healing grace. And Father, I pray that where our, our ears are, are dull, where our hearts are hard, where our tongues are tied, Father, would you come and speak your word, be opened, that we might once again know and, and relish in your truth and proclaim your goodness. We ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen.